welcome to Dublin City FM. You're listening to Council Matters with myself, Mick Fitzgerald. And even though it's lashing rain outside, the love in here is just so warm. Uh, we want to start off by wishing a huge kagodicus to uh, Councillor Michal McDonagh from Sinn Féin in Donamead out there. He's just become the new Lord Mayor. And I also want to uh, wish congratulations to Councillor Anya Clancy from the Labour Party who became the Deputy Lord Mayor, so it's all changing of the guard. But today we're welcoming back uh, Maliki Steenson, uh, solicitor and criminologist. So Maliki, welcome back again. Good morning, Mick. Yes. Maliki, the last time uh, we discussed uh, this topic, um, over a year ago, it attracted a great deal of interest, and that was mainly because it was around the time of the infamous Regency uh, incident. Um, Things have moved on a bit since then. <laughs> no, things have moved on slightly and that feud uh, continues, uh, particularly in the north in our city. But there has been effectively no real state reaction to mm -hmm. it, um, other than to paramilitarise the police force and put up armed checkpoints to mm -hmm. stop cars for tax, in effect. Mm -hmm. um, we have the state telling us, the Gardaí telling us that they stopped something like 29 murders. I mean, they may as well say 50. I mean, that's a very arbitrary figure you can mm -hmm. pluck out of the air. Um, and it's one that can be neither confirmed nor denied. Mm -hmm. um, but we have it within that feud, it, it shows, and I think the last time we talked about narco terrorism and all of that, and I, I see that the, the f outgoing Lord Mayor Brendan Carr talked about um, drug dealing and drug crime as being terrorism. So mm -hmm. a year later, the Labour Party are, are using the terminology that I started using last year. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that, that I pointed out last time um, was that the state set up, uh, has since set up now a second special criminal court. And those courts are used almost exclusively to deal with what the state describes as dissident crime. Mm -hmm. People who are opposed to the, the political setup and the political dispensation mm -hmm. in the North. They have not as of yet, with the exception of a few trials like the Limerick ones a number of years ago and the Gilligan trial mm -hmm. many years ago as well, they've not used it for um, dealing with serious criminals. It's mm -hmm. as if the state doesn't see the threat from these people as being similar to the perceived threat, which is effectively non-existent from all of the Republican uh, military groupings. Um, we're continuing to see people being stopped with large quantities quantities of drugs, large amounts of money, mm -hmm. even firearms, and getting bail. Mm -hmm. And that beggar's belief. Last time around, we also discussed the killing of Garda Adrian Donoghue mm -hmm. in um, Omeet. To date, nobody has been brought to book for that. The Americans have arrested one of the, the, the gunmen, apparently, for uh, breaches of immigration law. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I pointed out at the time that I believed, and I still believe this, that there is some connection between the intelligence services, both in the north and in the south, and the gang that murdered Adrian Donoghue. And one of the points I made is, okay. if the state is prepared to allow one of its own enforcers, a Garda, mm -hmm. to be killed, to pursue its own objectives, then none of us are safe from this state. Mm -hmm. The other side of the coin, Maliki, is that, uh, I mean, uh, in essence, we seem to have a parallel currency, and that parallel currency is drugs of whatever variety, you know, whether they're prescription drugs or whether they're illegal drugs. Um, despite, I don't know how many people have been killed in the, uh, the so-called Hodge Kinahan feud, there doesn't seem to be any diminution of supply. No, and again, you see, we're living... In two states. Yeah. There's the normal state where normal people work, pay their taxes, pay their bills, rear their children. Mm -hmm. And parallel to that, there's this other whole system that's working away where there's a totally separate economy where the drugs industry, and we see, see, where does it start? Where do people take their leadership from? Mm -hmm. We look at the people we elect, for instance. Mm -hmm. We go back to, to maybe the Lowry's and, and all of that, the Hotties, who are all seen to be gangsters, mm -hmm. um, brought before tribunals in general, not before courts that normal people are brought mm -hmm. before, found to have um, 
have very dodgy dealings and they get re-elected. Mm -hmm. In our own constituency we saw an aberration of an election in 2014 where mm -hmm. all kinds of people were standing, mm -hmm. um, many with dubious pasts. Mm -hmm. We've saw We've saw one, for instance, only a number of weeks ago, a man who was promoted as almost the, the, the next god coming by the provisional movement, um, was elected as a councillor in this constituency, Mr Dowdall. Mm -hmm. A man who was well known in Ballybock where he lived, mm -hmm. not for any inkling or interest in Republican politics or indeed any politics at all, but he had come to the attention on numerous occasions of local Republicans. Mm -hmm. And he was promoted through the Provisional Party by Mary Lou MacDonald. Yeah. And yet she has been sanitised and remains aloof or untouchable, almost like Teflon, yeah. from somebody who is now serving a very long sentence mm -hmm. for torture and kidnapping. Yeah. Can we come back to that one? Because that's one of the few cases we can mention by name. Now, uh, you were... Uh, one of the, probably the first person that I saw publicly referring to this particular case, and everybody was saying, "Oh, you know, uh, this is a uh, uh, this is Maliki going off on a rant, sort of thing." Um, and I always, uh, I was never sure because I, I didn't know who the man was. He had no background in politics whatsoever. What's your information about how did this person get selected onto the ticket in the first place? Leaving aside the, uh, how did he get? Uh, uh, elected, but how do you get selected? Well, if you look at how the provisional movement works, people are not selected in the normal sense. Yeah. They're rammed through, they're parachuted in, mm -hmm. the leadership decides. Mm -hmm. And MacDonald has to bear responsibility for that. She was the senior figure pushing this guy mm -hmm. who lived up the road from her on the Navan Road, mm -hmm. came from Ballybock originally, must have been the most successful electrician. Yeah in an economic collapse <laughs> of all time. Mm -hmm. There is much speculation of donations to the party mm -hmm. coming from, we know Through, that yeah. he is involved. That, uh, we have to go back to why was his house raided in originally. The okay. And the, as we understand it, the house was raided by Gardaí looking for weaponry that was used in the Regency. Okay. He was clearly being associated with the Hutch Kinnan feud. Mm -hmm. On what side remains to be seen, because there's such an overlap, mm -hmm. um, he's reputed to be on the Hutch side. Mm -hmm. He would be close, the younger Hutches were closely connected and involved with the Kinnans. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, and the falling out over the College Green money mm -hmm. is what led to this feud. Mm -hmm. So all of them of the younger generation were Kinahans at one stage. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So here we have somebody pushed through, and this was well known. I know a number of people who would be considered senior Republicans in this constituency who made it very clear to MacDonald and others mm -hmm. about, and people who had served time in prison for the provisionals, made it very clear the background to this guy. And they were ignored. Why were they ignored? What okay. did he bring to the party? Okay. Yeah. Bef when he... Uh, okay, C coming back to a couple of things. My understanding, uh, and this is what um, uh, would appear to uh, ha ha have been the case, is, is that when they raided the house and they found the so-called USB stick, they didn't go looking for uh, evidence of that. They didn't know anything of that. Uh, the, the, the idiot uh, had managed to keep a trophy of his actions. That they did uh, go looking for some link to the uh, the regency in that sense of the word. Uh, the person who uh, was tortured, a guy called Alexander Hurley, he made a claim that uh, Dowdle was suggesting he was a senior militant figure in the Republican movement. Now, was that just uh, him blowing his um, b blowing his ego off, or is there any is there any suggestion that that might have been actually true? Well, I've yet to meet anybody uh. within the Republican movement who had even heard of him in yeah. those terms mm -hmm. prior to him being launched as a candidate. Yeah. Um, and certainly figures that I would know involved in the Provisional Army are adamant uh -huh. that he was never a member of the Army. Okay. Um, but... 
you know, how do people like, and one of the problems we have now in politics is that there is a whole range of people similar to him who have no politics, who see politics now as a career move, as an ego trip. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with parties which are on the rise, like the provisionals, who just want sheep to parrot the party line mm -hmm. and to read prepared speeches, yeah. not to actually think. Yeah. Um, it's easy to, to, to progress through the ranks. We have other councillors. I mean, there's another city councillor who's, as I understand it, has been investigated for a serious assault on a young man in a, in a local pub. Okay. You know, and, and what, well, obviously we can't discuss that at this stage, but in, in time, <coughs> um, and, and as you pointed out, I was one of the first people to point out the inadequacies, let's say, of, of Mr. Dowdall. In time, um, this will be shown to be correct as well. I mean, I'm often minded of, of Cahill Goulding's uh, great comment that in relation to, to events in the, in the 70s and the position he was adopting on a number of things was that we were right, but we were right too early. Yeah, yeah. Coming back to this, and this is what I wonder about both the media and, and certainly the Gardaí, um, when this trial was going through, and you know, people like us, we knew about it for lo long in advance before it ever came to the public domain. The Gardaí have never said what they got the warrant for to raise his house. They just said, we didn't go looking for that. Now, we know what they went looking for, but why do you think that, A, the Gardaí have been so uh, shy and, and the media? Well, uh, well the Gardaí don't need to explain that, for instance. I yeah. mean, that would have come out in the course of the trial. But I, I think I recall when Dowda was on Joe Duffy, yeah. uh, almost crying because he had been raided by the guards. He, he yeah. made the point that it was a Section 29 warrant. Now, a Section 29 warrant under the Offence Against the State Act is a search for weapons. Yeah. Okay. Now, but, you know, you tell me about the media. the sub squad as well. <laughs> yes, because, <laughs> because he had a very large aquarium. <laughs> now, you see, the media, and, and this is a problem in general with the media, mm -hmm. where they refuse to discuss trials because they're ongoing or because it may be prejudicial, yeah. they say. Yeah. But this is over now. Yes, yeah. but that restriction always only was used where there was a jury to be influenced. Mm -hmm. Dowdall and others are tried before the Special Criminal yeah. Court. There is no jury. Okay. It's yeah. three judges sitting. Yeah. You know, so there is no... They can't be influenced. Okay, yeah. Well, something I heard about two weeks ago, and I wonder uh, if I could just uh, canvas your opinion on it, and I, because I thought... This is serious, you know, either this is a joke or uh, or it's really serious, is that the last uh, contract that Dowdle Electrics got, have you heard this one of where they got it for? Yes, I think, I, well, I've been yeah, deceived. What I, what I heard was that they got a contract to wire the central criminal courts. I hadn't heard that one. Yeah, no, I thought, no. <laughs> again, nothing was, and, yeah. and this is how, you see, 20 years ago, when I was discussing this, these matters with, with other our journalists and that, I pointed out that a day will come mm -hmm. when we will have drug dealers and their, or their protégés or, or their people in positions of elected power in this state. Mm -hmm. Dildar is not on his own. Mm -hmm. right? And we have politicians who are uh, clamouring for um, decriminalisation of possession of, of class of different mm -hmm. drugs, and it depends which one you go to. That, that yeah. on the basis that remove the criminals for it, almost to a one of those who are clamouring for that are banging coke up their own nose, yeah. and they don't see that they have a problem. You know, and we have to look at them, crime in general. Within the north inner city, there is an acceptable level of crime, mm -hmm. and Irish people, by and large, are corrupt. Mm -hmm. And they don't see anything wrong with whether it's getting a bit of stuff that, that was shoplifted or whatever. You know, there's, and there's different acceptability levels for different things. Mm -hmm. You know, um, for instance, nobody condones paedophilia. Yeah. Almost no one. Mm -hmm. um, except, of course, if you're involved in, in, the, in the previous feud, for instance, where yeah. people um, took sides based on yeah. wh where they stood in, in relation to the Griffin thing. And, you and know, this was in the Sheriff Street yeah. feud. Yeah. You know... So we need, you see, you know, and the state's reaction to this so-called feud mm -hmm. is to send in Mulvey to do a report. Mm -hmm. Now, I predicted what Mulvey would do. I predicted who he would see. Mm 
-hmm. and what the results would, would be. And I was right. And we had the usual talking heads come out and say, oh, well, the solution is more money for my project, yeah. but none for your man over there. Yeah. Give it to us yeah. and we'll solve it. There are tens of millions that go into the north in our city from state funds, from taxpayers' money, yeah. into dubious projects, which are self-sustaining, mm. in a sense. They need crime, they need drugs, and they need deprivation in order mm -hmm. to, to, to continue their own system. For in instance, if we got rid of drug addiction, mm -hmm. there would be an awful lot of people unemployed. Yeah. Likewise with homelessness and all of these other so-called social issues. We have politicians who tell us, oh, well, people go on drugs because they didn't go to Trinity. That is crap, yeah. right? Everybody doesn't need to go and get a dubious degree in some of the social studies of gender studies or women's studies or whatever and then go into working for one of these quangos or NGOs or, or, or whatever. People need to be given jobs. People need to... We, we need to go back to the vocational educational system, in fact. People need to be... Who are not academically minded need to, be, to go and get trades. And, and you know, no. everybody doesn't need... Want or have to go to college? Sure. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Can I put something to you? And you, uh, uh, you've raised the issue of the Republican movement. Now we know about the Republican movement in the North Inner City. It's always been there. It's been around for uh, 50, 60 years, as long as I can remember, in different guises. One of the issues. Now I wasn't here in the 80s, so I can't really sp uh, uh, speak with uh, any confidence on that. Is that we had various organisations like. Uh, Concerned Parents Against Drugs. Uh, we had, you know, drug vigilantes and a whole range of this. And this went right into the 90s. Um, what happened in that basis? Now, did, we don't seem to have that anymore. There's no, um, um, there's no visible or active uh, challenging to that. Have the Republican movement either become part of this or certain aspects of the Republican movement or have they just decided, well, there's nothing you can do? Well... If you look at the Concerned Parents in its earlier formation, mm -hmm. was a good ground, uh, grassroots mobilisation of people to actually stop an, uh, mm -hmm. drug dealing that was going on. The second time around, it was purely a move by the provisional movement to have their volunteers doing something while their political leaders were selling out everything that they were supposed to stand for. Mm -hmm. You had them marching past the doors of major drug dealers to march on lesser dealers. You had the whole involvement of the Dublin Brigade of, of the Provisional Army with the Griffin Gang and the container yeah. robberies right yeah. to, to um, from Dublin Port. Um, and as is well known, the Griffin Gang was a, a coke dealing gang. Yeah. And once you have that crossover, and I mean the, the Attorney General, I think he was Min uh, McDowell was Minister for Justice and he, he mentioned all of this in the doll. Mm -hmm. um, that the crossover once you start that crossover then you have no politics actually yeah. um, and it's purely about power and money and it failed because people realised that they were going to have to march you see in this community drug dealers are not people that come in from Mars mm -hmm. unless it's Mars on the Richmond Road perhaps <laughs> Although, that just can't. not suggesting for any not for a moment that there's anybody selling drugs on Mars yeah. just um the, it's people's own kids and when, you see you have parents whose 16 and 17 year olds are standing on street corners around here selling drugs whether it's tablets hash cocaine heroin mm -hmm. and their parents by and large many of them are benefiting from the income that's coming in from that mm -hmm. so it's not simply a matter of Johnny from Finglas is coming in and selling drugs here, it's people's own kids and people realise that they'd have to start marching on their own houses yeah. if they were going to solve this problem. But the state has no interest in solving it. You walk around here, you walk around um, Talbot Street, any of the streets off O'Connell Street, yeah. open drug dealing. Yeah. Nowhere else in the world I would suggest do you get that level of open drug dealing on, this, on, the, on the, the main street. You go to Chantelise, for yeah. instance, yeah. you won't find open drug dealing mm -hmm. or any other main street in any other European capital you will not find that level of crime mm -hmm. on the streets and what's our answer we take a hotel for instance 
Linus Hotel, which the should be a property that's getting 200 euro a night and bringing in tourists, and we turn her over into a homeless hub. You know, one of the most expensive streets mm -hmm. in the city. Mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that's the kind of st stupidity that goes on in this country. Yeah. Take something now, Malachi, and this is again, we go back to the last town council election, and it was uh, very reliably put to me that one of the candidates, um, their family were very heavily involved in tobacco, uh, you know, dealing, which is, you could argue, is white-collar crime because the drug is legal. Do we have a different attitude uh, when the drug is legal, in that sense of the word, whether it's prescription drugs or whether it's tobacco? Um, now... As I say, if you thought uh, it was openly being, uh, if things were openly being dealt on O'Connell Street, they're even more openly being dealt on in Moore Street. Well, I think people take a different view to, to tobacco sales because they see that as just not paying tax, for instance. Yeah. They see the government taking such a huge amount of the price of a packet of cigarettes that Irish people don't see tax evasion as a real crime. No, no. It's, um, a, it's and, almost and a duty. Yeah. yeah. Um, now... Uh. When those who argue about decriminalising drugs, here's the perfect example of something that's legal, which is now the, the bulk of sales of that product are now, is now in the hands of criminals. Yeah. There are more cigarettes sold on the streets than there are in shops. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't need... One of the things that we discussed in our last talk was, you know, we continue to make the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. We decriminalise drugs... Ultimately, we will end up yeah. where we are with cigarettes mm -hmm. because the government will see it as a, a huge uh, a, a tax a take. Uh, raise. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, I mean, if you look at, for instance, injection centres, yeah. you know, we're continuing to facilitate people's greed and people's self-absorption. Mm -hmm. And people... See, I, I mean, I, I've gone and I've... Right throughout my... my, my family we've had a number of people died from drugs and from overdoses mm. with people in, in re so-called recovery we have gone the whole ambit of this i don't believe in addiction mm. people take drugs and the, the, the most honest thing a drug dealer or a drug addict said to me was my brother-in-law dennis who, who's dead a number of years now overdose and i said to him one time why do you take drugs because I like it. Yeah, yeah, and that is exactly that's the reason. exactly what people are going to tell yeah. you. Yeah, and he was at least was honest in that. Yeah. But he was somebody, like the rest of them, who abandoned their responsibilities mm -hmm. and believed that the state and that the people somehow owed them a living. Mm -hmm. And, you know, until we move out of that mindset and say, we're not going to tolerate mm -hmm. people either selling drugs or taking them. We're not going to tolerate children looking at their parents strung out we're not going to tolerate our kids or anybody else's kids selling drugs to other people's kids yeah, yeah. can i come back to you now now this is a controversial issue i lived in sydney for nearly 20 years and the general view the, the people were much more open about talking about these things the general view was that you could not have the level of uh, shall we say illegal commerce um in a city without some form of police corruption. Now, police corruption, I always work on the basis, uh, operates on three levels. The first level is you turn a blind eye to it. The second level is you get a bit of a cut. And the third level is you actually are an entrepreneur in it. Um, what's your feeling on that? Well, I mean, I've said for years that there has to be not just a, a police involvement, but a higher state involvement. Mm -hmm. I remember as, as uh, General Secretary of ACRA, the, mm -hmm. the residence body, mm -hmm. meeting with senior Gardaí, not long after um, that model died from a drugs overdose, Katie French. Katie French. Yeah. And that's the only time somebody was actually charged with supplying drugs to yeah. somebody who died. Yeah. And I raised the issue of Western Aerodrome yeah. and the Mansfield's plane. Mansfield is now dead, so we can talk about him. His yeah. plane being caught in Belgium, I think, yes. full of coke. It was heroin as well. Yeah. yeah. And I s simply asked the question, what is there customs in Western, which he owned? Yeah, yeah. Is there a guard of presence? Is anybody searching these planes coming yeah. in? And the senior guard said to me, we're not allowed. Yeah. And that, to me, yeah. summed up the state's policy. Here we had, not the Kinnahans, not some young yeah. from Ballybock or from Crumlin 
important drugs. We had people who built huge complexes and without planning permission, in fact, mm. um, people who are in that high establishment world, people who are friends with politicians, people who are donors to political parties, mm. people who are um, very closely, in Mansfield's case, tied up with, with Fianna Fáil. Um, and these people were the main importers mm. of drugs into this country mm. and nothing done about it. Mm. So if you have it at that level, and you have then on, on, the, on the, the, the ground level, you have people in communities who tolerate lower levels of crime and, and that because that's the way it is. Um, you're not going to solve the problem. Yeah. You know, and there's no will or intention to solve it. And the, always the answer is, sure, we'll throw some more money at it. And, you know, and we'll buy off a few more people. And sure, it doesn't matter if your kids are dying, sure, you yeah. know. Yeah. Something, and again, you would possibly know a bit more about this, and it always, uh, again, from my experience in Australia, you you know, when people talk in certain uh, ways, there's a boxing club uh, in the north inner city, uh, and again, it's got associations with certain people. Jonathan Dowdle, I believe, was involved in it. Now, when that boxing club was opened about uh, uh, 10 years ago, they brought in a chief super. Uh, and I always remember his speech, because it was reported in the newspapers, and he was praising the boxing club and bringing, you know, this was an outlet for young people and it was, uh, you know, they, they, they could, you know, get into sport and all of this sort of stuff. And I always remember what he said. He said, uh, I don't mind whether a man is a, a cardinal or a bishop or a monk as long as he's doing good things in the community. And that struck me as being, hold on, mate. You know, uh, th this suggests that, you you know, you have either lost your moral compass or your uh, your bank account's going up. Yeah. But you see, and I mean, the Gardaí, particularly, um, for instance, Superintendent Inspector mm. Leahy, who's now an assistant commissioner, we're only interested in PR. Yeah. And this pretense that we're actually doing something. Yeah. When, in fact, they were only concerned about pursuing their own career. Yeah. Nothing has changed, and I mean that comment doesn't surprise me. Um, mm. And we we have that kind of warped thinking, mm. and on and, and that's grand if we want the situation to continue. And I'm always minded of what Larry Dunn said when he was being oh, brought yeah. away yeah. to be sentenced, one of the first drug dealers. Mm. Um, if you thought we were bad, wait till you, wait till you see what's coming behind. And each generation, and yeah. it's yeah. vicious out there. Yeah. Last but by no means, Lise Maliki, when we spoke the last time, it was the Regency, and we thought, oh yeah, this is bad. Do you think we've seen the worst yet, or do you think more is to come? There's probably more to come, and if it's not in this particular feud, it will be in somebody else's feud. Yeah. Because these, as these younger people come along, they've no fear of death themselves. Mm. They know that they'll have a short life, and it's about here and now. And they'll do whatever they feel like doing. Yeah. Malachi, we've uh, this whole range of things we didn't get through to about uh, houses of ill repute and people getting new houses and all sorts of things like that, but that'll be for another day. So Malachi Steenson, criminologist and uh, solicitor, thanks for your time today. <laughs>